And the DuSable Harbor, the DuSable Museum, and the DuSable Bridge are just a few places in the city named after Chicago's first resident. So Chris DeRose takes a closer look at his life in today's Did You Know? Facts about Chicago's first settler are scarce. What we do know about Jean-Baptiste Plante de Sable is that he was born in Haiti around 1745 to a French sailor father and an African slave mother. It's not clear what happened to his family or how his early life was spent. Some accounts say that Dussable's mother was killed by the Spanish, prompting his French father to take him back to France with him, and yet other accounts have him living in Haiti until he was a young adult. What we do know is that by the 1760s, Dussable winds up in the port city of New Orleans. It was in New Orleans that Dussable would make connections with trappers and traders moving up the Mississippi into what is today Illinois. By the early 1770s, Dussable made his way to Peoria, where he married a Potawatomi woman named Catherine. Together they had two children, and by 1780, they had settled along the Chicago River. It's here in what is today Pioneer Court that Dussable set up a home and a prosperous fur trading post. Traders used to come from all over the region to trade at the mouth of the Chicago River. Dussable served everyone from French to British to Native Americans, and he spoke half a dozen languages and dialects. By all accounts, he became a wealthy merchant, and though his home was modest outside, his property boasted bacon smokehouses, stables, huts for employees, a garden, and even an orchard. In 1800, Dussable sold his property and moved to St. Charles, Missouri. Now, it's believed in Missouri he made several bad investments because of the time of his death in 1818, he was practically destitute. There's a lot of mystery surrounding DeSable in his life, but the one thing we do know is that his settlement here helped establish what would become one of the greatest cities in the world. And that is a fact. Did you know? Actually, I did. Mm. I didn't really know. Because they tell you this story at the DuSable Museum when you go. Oh, it's true. Yeah, very it's, cool. yeah. One of the stories I dug up about DuSable that I really had no idea about was during the American Revolution, which a lot of people think that this area really didn't have anything to do with the revolution. DuSable was living in Michigan City, Indiana, and the British were trying to control the Great Lakes, and they wanted to build a fort near his land. He protested, and they arrested him as a colonial sympathizer. What? Yeah, and they huh. actually took him to the biggest fort in the region, which was Fort Mackinac, which is up on Lake Huron in the Straits of Mackinac. And the cool thing is uh, you can actually go up to Fort Mackinac. It's still there. It's, uh, oh, it's this cool. beautiful li living history fort. It's, I think, the oldest uh, state historic site in Michigan, and it's really cool to check out. So if you're ever up that way, uh, head over to the island and see it. But oh. he was uh, in prison there during the Revolutionary War, and then afterward, of course, came to Chicago, hmm. made his way here. Didn't know that it was this far west for the American right? Revolution. Yeah. Well, the British were, you know, everything was pushing this way, and the fur trade was out here, so there was oh. a lot of money to be had. The French were, were in parts of Canada, and they, they wanted to get in on it. The British wanted to get in on the fur trade. Because this was still the French territory, right? Well, or just... the, it was west of here. Technically British ish. It okay. was all it was British ish. Yeah. Ish. It was Wild West. You know, everybody yeah. wanted to get a claim because there was a lot of money right. to be made out here. Not only that, fur trade with natural resources, you know, there's a ton of timber and shipping and all that stuff. And then he loses his fortune, like without the help of the government. Like what did he do? What what happened? Again, it's kind of spotty. I don't know exactly what investments he hmm. made that went bad, but he did end up destitute. He ended up in St. Charles, Missouri, and he's buried in uh, in a Catholic cemetery there. And when he was buried, it was in an unmarked grave because he really didn't have any money. But in 1968, the Illinois Susquecentennial Commission uh, went to the cemetery and they laid uh, this tombstone down for him in his honor, that's in his nice. memory, yeah. and that's still there today. And you can go check that out if you're ever in St. Charles, Missouri. But one other thing I found out about our good friend de Sable is in 1987, he was actually honored by the United States Postal Service with his very own stamp. And that debuted and was uh, put into circulation for a while. It you. was 22 cents. <laughs> Yeah, right? What wow. is it now? Like, like $162. Yeah, dollars. <laughs> you can't, can't chip anything for 22 cents anymore. It's like right. when you see the old films uh, from the 90s and they have the old gas prices, like $125. Right. Oh, that was nice. Yeah. yeah. And they still had um, 
what do you call those things that are outside and you put the quarter in? A phone oh, booth? a pay phone? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. How quickly we forget. <laughs> know, you know, right? what's that called? You put the phone. Here's right. my number and a dime. We do have uh, uh, some good did you knows coming up. I, I do want to say we're doing the history of Wacker Drive next week. So we learn oh, all cool. about uh, its upper development. And upper and lower and lower, lower. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is creepy, yeah. creepy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love exactly. it. Love it, love it, Chris. Thank all you right. so much, my no dear. Problem. We'll As see you next always. week.